Happy Sunday. Happy Easter. Uh, my name is Brian. It's great to be studying the Word of God with you today. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and see what they say. Some of them were eyewitnesses. Uh, Luke seemed to have been interviewing eyewitnesses a little bit later on. And uh, we're going to see what they say about these events, and they're going to cover different details. There's going to be moments in which the stories sequence together, uh, and there's going to be moments that each author, uh, either they were the sole witness of, or in Luke's case, it seemed like he had interviewed some of the, the women followers of Jesus, and he captured some of the moments that they had experienced with the Lord. And uh, so uh, what I've done is I've done my best to do to present to do a possible harmonization of these accounts and much like eyewitness accounts in any scenario they won't always at first seem to be in agreement there might even be moments that they appear to disagree uh, but that's not necessarily the case and in fact there's an increased uh, trusting and reliability that can come about as a result of seeing that these narratives kind of piece together and that uh, real eyewitness testimony often has moments that will seem as though there are contradictions. Now, the outline that I've made today is by no means the gospel, okay? I'm using all <laughs> of the gospel accounts, yes, uh, but this may not be the actual sequence of events. And uh, some people have had moments in which, you know, they've been like, hey, this feels like a contradiction. But what I want to encourage you with is that there are multiple plausible ways to sequence these events that result in no contradictions whatsoever. Uh, but at the same time, I don't necessarily know which is the right way. And so I might allude to some of those things uh, this morning. Uh, also, uh, I once again have some artwork that is pulled from the Bible Project uh, and their YouTube videos. Uh, so go check those out if you have a chance. So here we go. Matthew 27 and 28, I'm pulling from both. Uh, when it was evening. So this is Friday evening, uh, the day of preparation. And so uh, the day before before the Sabbath. And so this is Friday evening, the day before Saturday. Uh, Jesus has just died. Uh, he's been crucified. He has said, it is finished. And he's given up his spirit unto the Father. And so now we're left with this sad moment in which some of his followers are trying to figure out what to do next. There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. Uh, right, in multiple accounts, they all kind of in indicate that, right, from the Jewish town of Arimathea, uh, who was also, also was a disciple of Jesus. And so two of the accounts indicate that he was a respected member of the council. And so this would have been the Jewish council, uh, one of the councils that had, in fact, put Jesus on trial, uh, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. So he was seeking for the truth. He's trying to figure out what is God doing in the midst of this. This, this likely was not the way that he thought God's kingdom was going to be established on the earth. Uh, in Luke's account, it says he was a good and righteous man who had not consented to the decision and action, uh, speaking of, right, the putting Jesus to death, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. And so I want to suggest to you today that maybe you don't yet believe these things, but if you are seeking God's kingdom, if you are seeking and knocking and asking, Jesus promises that you will get an answer. You will find him. The door will be open to you. And the same thing happened for this man, Joseph. And so he went to Pilate, and right, Pilate was the governor, the Roman, that had authorized Jesus being put to death and asked for the body of Jesus. And this is because Jesus is, is dead, all right? So there's not a possibility of a swoon theory in which he simply had fainted. fainted. Now, what's interesting is in Mark's account, which is uh, Mark is likely a disciple of Peter, uh, it says that he took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, 
while in John's account it says secretly for fear of the Jews he asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And so he's on the council and he's afraid of the Jewish opinion of him, right? And so he's still a little bit timid in that regard. After all, they had just stirred up a crowd and a riotous mob and brought about the crucifixion of Jesus. So he, he hasn't yet uh, been comfortable, I guess, to, to risk that with them. But nonetheless, right, and you could imagine he had a moment of wrestling. He's like, all right, but I'm still going to go ask Pilate, which still took some courage because Pilate uh, did try Jesus uh, as a traitor. And even though Pilate believed he was innocent, uh, it's possible he could have brought down wrath on Joseph as well. Now, Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, right? Pilate was surprised that Jesus had died. But he doesn't just take Joseph's word for it, and summoning a centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead, and when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, Pilate then ordered uh, the body, it, notice it doesn't even say he, to be given to him. Uh, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And so I want to point out, multiple people believe that Jesus has died, including a centurion uh, who was present at the time. That right, that there was even the centurion that had uh, pierced the side of Jesus, in which blood and water had flowed out. Uh, they would have been good at their jobs, and they would not have wanted a prisoner to escape in any way. And so they testify as experts of those who right would put people to death. They know what they're talking about. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away the body. Now this is cool. In John's account only, we learn that Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came uh, to work with Joseph of Arimathea. And so let's see. So uh, what's this moment? Uh, John 3 is when Nicodemus, also a religious teacher of the law, had come to visit Jesus. And I wanted to just quickly highlight this passage here. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. This is Jesus talking uh, in John chapter 3 in the middle of the night because Nicodemus is also a little bit afraid. He's going to investigate who Jesus is at this time. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, you can go check out that story, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And what's interesting is this lifted up is actually alluding to the crucifixion and in which Jesus is lifted up on high for people to see. And the reason is that he must be lifted up is that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that, once again, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, at least in the first sending, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And so Joseph is going to get the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus, who has had this encounter with Jesus, where Jesus even tells him, like, you must be born again. You can't even see God's kingdom unless you've been born again. And no, now I imagine that Nicodemus is probably like a little bit confused. He's like, I've talked to this person. Maybe I've come to the conclusion that he's the son of God, but I'm going to go get his body down from a Roman crucifix right now. And so Nicodemus also goes, but he came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. And Joseph, right, took the body. Right? They took the body of Jesus right together as a team. And uh, Joseph bought. And so whether before this evening or in that evening, he goes and buys a linen shroud and wrapped it. Uh, he wrapped the body in that clean linen shroud and taking him down, he wrapped him. Right, He bound him in the linen cloths with the spices, as is the custom of uh, the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, 
a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Uh, it had been right cut in the rock and laid him in a tomb in which no one had let been, yet been laid. I believe, maybe it's not in one of these passages, it might have been prior or later, that it was actually Joseph's tomb, uh, his actual tomb. Now once again, now Luke brings this up, that it was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. And so because of this, uh, the, uh, and since the tomb was close at hand, right, like they had to bring his body a short distance and try to hastily get Jesus buried before sunset uh, when the Sabbath begins officially. And actually, that's one of the things that uh, possibly interesting as well. Uh, there was the multi, I think it was three hours of darkness during Jesus's dying on the cross, uh, and then that darkness would have ended and there would have been the recognition that it wasn't actually nighttime, uh, right? And so the, you know, there would have been sunlight and sunset to indicate when the Sabbath was beginning. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. And so, uh, so the, the tomb is sealed by a stone. Now, Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary, right, Mary, uh, the mother of Joses, uh, the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And so these women were still watching. They were present as the body of Jesus was moved. They were watching as Jesus is brought into the tomb and laid to rest, and the stone is rolled in front. And so they observed, they took note, I want to point out, of where Jesus was buried. And then they uh, had returned and prepared spices and ointments. And on the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. And so these women, right, Friday evening, they see Jesus buried, they go to their homes and they begin preparing their own spices and their own ointment but then the Sabbath happens, and they're like, all right, it's the day of rest. And so they wait. Now, on the next day, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how the imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, right? And so this is like a false representation, uh, that they would tell the people that he is risen from the dead. Let's see. Oops, sorry, sorry. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to him, you have a guard of soldiers go make it secure as you can, and right, and so he would have uh, likely been referring to not necessarily Roman soldiers, but possibly the temple soldiers, and so they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard, and so this seal, uh, it's possible, could be something like, kind of like how royalty would seal a letter, uh, right, trying to indicate that this hasn't been tampered with. They had some sort of way of sealing it and providing evidence uh, that it stayed closed. And so let's see, new chapter, 28, 16, 24, and 20. Uh, now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn, right, is what Matthew says, of the first day of the week, uh, at early dawn is what Luke says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Right, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome uh, brought spices so that they might anoint him. Right, and so those spices that they'd prepared Friday, they're now bringing. Uh, and so that's what they ended up doing. Now, in John's narrative, he specifically says Mary Magdalene alone. Uh, and there's, it's possible that he was indicating one primarily of a group. It's also possible, one of the possible uh, sequences of this is that Mary Magdalene went prior to the other women, uh, or that because John ends up encountering primary, 
primarily Mary Magdalene later in the narrative, he, that's the woman, uh, the woman that he happens to be thinking of. And in, in John's narrative, it says, well, it was still dark, right, that she came to the tomb. And so it's possible, right, like maybe she went early or maybe she started off while it was still dark. Bunch of different ways that this could work out. And very early on the first day, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And so these women had witnessed the previous, uh, or Friday night, uh, they, they saw the body laid and the, the tomb uh, sealed and enclosed by this boulder, and while they're walking, they're like, hey, we wouldn't be able to open this. Who's going to open this tomb for us? And then there's kind of like this meanwhile that Matthew does. All right, so flash, you know, back or prior to this moment, one of those ways. Uh, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men, right? That the guards end up fainting. And so only Matthew's narrative includes this. It's possible maybe Matthew becomes friends with one of these guards after the fact. Maybe one of these guards becomes a follower of Jesus. We know that some of the Pharisees who had sentenced Jesus to death, some of them had likely become followers of Jesus. And you can read in the book of Acts how some of the Pharisees were, right, part of these decisions about the early church. And now back to the, the ladies, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. So once again, uh, Mark is indicating like these women are wondering who's going to move the stone for us. And once again, verifying it's because the rock is quite large. And they found it rolled away from the, the tomb and entering the tomb. Okay. Uh, when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And now uh, as far as um, John's account, Mary is the only person that's mentioned. Mary saw that the stone had been taken away, and it just says that she then runs to tell the disciples, which we'll come at in a moment. Uh, so one of the, the possible explanations is that maybe these women went together, and Mary, upon seeing the, the stone rolled away, she then sends out as a messenger and goes to tell the disciples, while the other two women, or however many women were there, enter into the tomb and uh, verify. So there's that's another possible uh, way this is occurring. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And uh, in Mark's account, he only mentions uh, one. He, they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed, right? They were surprised. Or in Luke's account, they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And so, uh, right, this one says standing, this one says sitting. It's possible they were sitting. And then when they walk in, they stand up, right? Or depending on which perspective uh, Mark or Luke is writing from, which woman that they ended up interviewing, right, they could have ended up having a slightly different account. Uh, now, Luke's account says that there are two separate angels, uh, and Mark and Matthew say that there's only one. It's possible Mark and Matthew are only highlighting the fact that maybe one of those angels was speaking. Uh, but the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, right? Do not be alarmed. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified, right? Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. And then this wonderful question, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Uh, let's see, let's scroll down a bit. Right, he is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered 
into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, right? And so not the angels' words, right? They remembered the words of Jesus. And so here's one of the instances in Luke's account, right? This is Luke's account that's kind of mentioning this, in which Jesus did say that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and be killed and on the third day be raised. And in fact, in this chapter of Luke, it almost sounds like Jesus says something similar three separate times in which he's predicting his death. And one time he's even saying like, put this into memory, like remember this fact, this is significant. And so Jesus had in fact predicted his own death and resurrection. Uh, and I, I do want to point out, not only does Jesus predict this, but so did uh, the Old Testament scriptures and the prophets. And then the angel says, come see the place where he lay and then go quickly and tell his disciples, right? See the place where they laid him and uh, Mark's account, which, like I said earlier, there are multiple reasons throughout the whole gospel, not just this one or two chapters, that it seems as though Mark is writing uh, what Peter had experienced, that there's a lot of moments of narrative that are specific to Peter's uh, observations and experiences. And what's interesting here is it says, but tell his disciples and Peter. And I think this is interesting that Jesus singles out Peter in this moment. Because the last time, it seems anyway, that Peter and Jesus had even looked at each other was in this moment. Uh, where Jesus is, this might have been when he was at uh, Caiaphas uh, on trial in the middle of the night. And multiple times people are thinking they recognize Peter as one of Jesus' disciples. And they say, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, right, and he actually multiple other times had already said, I don't know this man, sort of thing like that. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And so, in this moment that Peter had denied Jesus, and Jesus is on trial after being arrested, they make eye contact, right? Jesus looks at Peter and knows, and just that he, as he had told Peter already, you're going to deny me. And he sees Peter in that moment, the same moment that the rooster crows, as Jesus predicted. And Peter, remembering the, the saying of the Lord, how he'd said before the rooster crows, uh, today you will deny me three times, he went out and wept bitterly. And so this was like Peter's last encounter with the Lord. And the Lord is already working to restore their relationship, their friendship, that if there's any uh, tension, if there's any doubt in Peter's mind, he's telling these women, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Like, I want to make sure he knows that I'm inviting him to this experience too, that I have not turned my back on him simply because he had denied me, right? And so... Uh, Right, go and tell the disciples, behold, all right, well, one, sorry, that he has risen from the dead. That's good to know. Uh, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Right, and so uh, Jesus is going to end up meeting his disciples in Galilee. At this point, they're, they're hiding out in Jerusalem. Uh, it had, you know, it's still the Passover. And so they departed quickly from the tomb, and they went out and fled from the tomb. Uh, and right in John's account, it's just Mary. Mary alone maybe had fled earlier, uh, and she had run. And what's interesting is the women uh, in Matthew and Mark, it says, with fear and great joy, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. Right? They ran to tell his disciples, and they're uh, so frantic that they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Right, So they're, that's not to say that they never tell the disciples, because if we keep reading, that's you know the case, it's implied, and it's written down, <laughs> so we could kind of assume that that's the case. But it seems as though on the road that anyone they came across, they just kept 
They just kept going. Uh, but these women are afraid, having encountered this angel, afraid of like this whole experience and the death of Jesus that had just happened and all of this. And they're also like full of great joy that they're, that they're astonished. They're like, like, could this be true that, that Jesus is risen, right? We were just reminded of this promise that he made, that he would rise on the third day. And now it seems to be indicating that this is the case. An angel has literally just told us this. And so they're, they're in this mixed emotion of both fear and astonishment and great joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. And so here's Bible Project's little uh, graphic of them running over the hill. And returning from the tomb, uh, they went, and in Mary's case, to Simon Peter. Now it's possible they went all to the same group. It seems like that's the case, especially once we read further in Luke. Uh, but maybe the conversation was primarily with Simon Peter and John and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. And so there's more than just the 11 disciples that are, that are currently in hiding. Uh, so Mary's report in John's account says they have taken the Lord. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And so uh, even though John's whole narrative uh, is singular about Mary, notice in this one moment, she uses the word we. And so even though John's only been focused on Mary's experience here, he does document the fact that she used this word, right? Implying there was more than just her involved. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James uh, and the other women with them. And so there, there's actually like, it sounds like more, five women possibly, uh, five or more uh, with them who told these things to the apostles. And you might think like this, this is going to be great news. Like the apostles are going to be thrilled at this, right? Because they're, they're hiding out. Uh, and this is what ends up happening. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. And so I want to point out that the gospel narratives frequently have what would be considered embarrassing testimony that those who are writing it, uh, that those who are being written about, those who are leaders in the church movement at the time when the Gospels are written, that they include parts of their lives in which things like Peter denying Jesus, right? They include parts like they're not being quick to believe the testimony of these women and even the words of Jesus that he was going to raise from the dead on the third day. And so this is uh, one additional way in the cumulative case of evidence as to why the gospel accounts are true uh, is because they include these moments that are embarrassing. Like you would think that if you were trying to start some world religion and you were going to be one of the leaders in that religion, that you would try to make yourself out to be uh, a little bit more of a credible source, right? And try to brag a little bit more. And we'll actually, speaking of which, we will see a moment of bragging coming up in a minute. But uh, I've pulled this uh, verse from later in Peter's life, 2 Peter, shortly before his death, 2 Peter 1, in which he says this, <coughs> For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And so Peter's saying like, listen, we didn't follow myths about this. I know the difference between these myths and these Roman religions and what we actually experienced when we actually saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain and Moses and Elijah and the voice of God speaking, saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. He's like, we didn't, we didn't just follow clever myths, okay? Or with the resurrection story of Jesus, they were in fact slow to believe. They were skeptical of these things, right? And, and later on he says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well, 
right? So you and I, those that he's actually writing to, you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own, someone's own interpretation. And so Peter, later on in life, he's saying, listen guys, we didn't just make up these stories. We were eyewitnesses. We didn't follow cleverly devised myths, right? We investigated these things. We were suspicious and skeptical at first. And, and he says, what's even better, right? You might think like, I wish I got to see this evidence of the risen Jesus. He says, actually, you and I have something almost better. We have the prophetic word where God, through the scriptures, right, through the prophets, had written down these events hundreds of years before they occurred. And so we have this greater confidence than merely the testimony of what these eyewitnesses had encountered. We have the fulfillment of prophecy. So even though they did not believe, Peter was willing to investigate. Peter rose and ran to the tomb. And so I want to point out, when you first hear the claims of the Bible, when you first hear the hope of salvation from some Christian, you're allowed to be a little bit skeptical. But it wouldn't be wise to respond by just being like, ah, maybe that's true. I'm never going to look into it. No, no, no. If this is true, this is the best news you could ever hear. This is, this is the, the thing that gives hope to this world. This is why Christians are called and expected to be able to give a reason for the hope that is in them. All right. That the right thing to do is to investigate like uh, Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus, right? That you look into the kingdom of God, be looking for this possibility because God's going to have the evidence available for you, right? Whether fulfillment of prophetic word or through textual analysis or your own experience as the spirit of God is at work in you verifying these claims, right? Seek the truth. Seek God's kingdom and you too can experience these wonderful things that Christians have been experiencing for thousands of years. Right? And so Peter, he doesn't believe it, but he investigates. He runs to the tomb. And in this case, we find out not only did Peter, but so too the other disciple. Right? This is John that's with Peter after hearing from Mary Magdalene. And they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. And this, I love this about <laughs> John. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, right? Like John's writing this as an older man. The other gospels have already been written and he's realizing with his death likely coming soon, he's like, I need to write down these pieces of the story that only I know about or having read some of these other gospels, I need to document and fill in the gaps that, that would die with me if they're not written down. And Oddly enough, he includes little moments like this where he's like, oh, by the way, did you know I'm faster than Peter? Uh, and like, this wasn't like a dig against Peter. They, you know, they were friends. Uh, but nonetheless, like he includes this little snippet about I was, I, was, I, I beat him to the tomb. Uh, and stooping to look in, John saw the linen cloths lying there, but did not go in. And now Peter catches up and he stoops and looks in and, uh, right, following him, went into the tomb and he saw the same things by themselves. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus's head, all right, and so this includes some other details, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And so, right, Jesus folds up the face cloth, sets it aside after he's raised from the dead. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, once again, like, he's, he's, he's like, I just want to, I want it to be known for all of Christian history preserved in the word of God that I, I won the race. 
uh, he also went in, he saw, and believed. Now it's possible, does he now believe the claims of the women that the body was missing? Or is he believing in a far greater fashion? Is he believing that Jesus is in fact the Messiah? Has he con come to the conclusion that Jesus has been raised from the dead, which the angels did instruct the women to claim? And so I want to uh, take a look at some of these other verses that John writes about in which, right, last chapter, which we read last week during the crucifixion, he says, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. Or at the end of John uh, 20, which we're reading right here, it says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of in the presence of his disciples. So the risen Jesus did many other signs, but it's also possible he's talking about the earthly ministry of Jesus prior to his death and resurrection. It says, which are not written in this book. He's like, the purpose of my writing this wasn't for you to know every little detail about the life of Jesus, although that would have been wonderful for us to have known those details, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so the Apostle John writes these details down for us, right? He writes his whole gospel and fills in the details that the other gospels didn't have. He writes this down because this is the moment where he, he saw and believed. This is the moment where it clicked for him. And that belief transformed his life. It changed him from the inside out. It gave him hope, right? It completely transformed who he was. And he invites you and I to experience the same thing. That he says, this, this Jesus loves me and died for me and saved me. And you can have that same experience you can experience the same thing. And that by believing that he is the Christ, right? The Messiah, the anointed one, the, the savior sent by God, the suffering servant to bear our sin, that you and I could be made right before God. If we believe that he is the son of God, that by believing in his name, that we may have life. And so this is similar to what he said, uh, quoting Jesus in John 3, Right, that if we believe, we will not perish, but have eternal life. That John wants you to have eternal life, to know and experience life with Jesus. And not just in this life, but for all of eternity. And so this is cool. This is the moment where John himself believes. For as yet they did not understand the scripture. All right, there's, there's parts of this that didn't make sense. That he must rise from the dead that they were like still like baffled even though jesus had blatantly said hey remember this fact uh they didn't and they uh then the disciples went back to their homes right and so so they're just like okay jesus's body is gone this is so weird right this is unusual and uh <clears throat> as far as luke's account talking about peter it says he went home marveling at what had happened. And so, so Peter's amazed. He's surprised. He's shocked. He might not yet believe that Jesus has risen. And there's this, uh, a little bit later in the, uh, in the chapter, uh, it talks about these other two disciples who are, they leave Jerusalem on Sunday. They've heard word from these women and they're just like up and gone. But notice, uh, we'll visit this in, uh, on a, in a later sermon, but Jesus ends up encountering them. And they're talking to Jesus and telling Jesus what happened that weekend with this individual that they thought was the Christ. They said, moreover, some women of our company amazed us, right? Some women had told us the story that they were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that, they even had uh, even they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive, and so they're like these two disciples had heard that story and they're like, man, this is weird. 
This is so unusual. And some of those, and so this is interesting as well, who were with us. And so even though in Luke's account, it said only uh, that Peter had ran, uh, and John's account said Peter and John left, later in the same chapter, it said that there was more than one that went to investigate. Okay, and so, like, this is the sort of thing, like, you could be like, oh, it's a contradiction. Only Peter went to the tomb and not Peter and John. No, no, it's not a contradiction. It's just not, that detail wasn't included in a previous sentence, but it was included later on in the same chapter, right? Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And so, I, what I want you to think about, these disciples, Peter and the other disciples didn't believe the women's testimony. If you don't believe it upon first hearing the gospel, that's like the common Christian experience. The very disciples didn't believe when they first heard that Jesus was raised from the dead. Okay, so like you're in good company. But not only that, then when, the, when Peter and John go and investigate, it seems as though John possibly comes to believe. Peter, I think, is still marveling. He goes back to the other disciples and even verifies what these women have said to a point. And then these two disciples that end up like still being confused and having thought that Jesus was the Christ, they don't stick around. They, they don't stick around. They literally are like, wow, we were just told by these women that angels visited them and said that Jesus was risen and that Jesus' tomb was empty, and then it was verified by these two guys, ah, I'm out of here. Right? And they literally leave Jerusalem. They, they leave in that moment. They don't hang out to find out more details. Now, fortunately, Jesus hunts them down. Right? Like, Jesus goes and finds these guys on the road and encounters them and has communion with them. Right until they then finally have it revealed to the fact the, to them the fact that Jesus is raised from the dead. Okay, but I just want to point out like this is how skeptical we can be as humans to believe good news, and so you're not right. Like you're in good company is I guess the way I should say it. Right, if you are at first skeptical of these these claims, and you probably should be skeptical at first look. Now, in John's Gospel, so I've got John's Gospel taking up two columns now, it says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And so it sounds as though Peter and John went running ahead. They find the tomb that way, and maybe Mary walked slower or traveled with them, that they end up heading home, and she chooses to stay at the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body had, of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Women, woman, why are you weeping? Right? And so uh, they're asking kind of like this, right, weird, weird question like in her mind. But for them, it's like, why would you be sad about this? You've already heard that Jesus is raised. Okay? Uh, and she said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And now uh, the end of Mark's gospel includes some passages that aren't found in some of the earlier manuscripts. So whether that means that it wasn't originally a part of it, whether it was added after the fact by perhaps a disciple uh, that had heard some right verbal testimony and was like, I need to include this, or whether the original manuscript had that part possibly destroyed and then someone after the fact had added it back. Whatever the case may be, here's verse 9. In Mark's account. Uh, now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, that's talking about, right, Jesus, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. And so Mary is the first person that Jesus makes his resurrection known to in a complete way. Mary Magdalene, whom he had cast out seven demons, right? And so, uh, once again, if you've had a really screwed up life, you're in good company. That doesn't exclude you from being able to believe, repent, and be saved and experience freedom in Jesus. And having said this, she turned around 
and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. Right, and so even though she's been visited by angels, it doesn't seem as though she's believed their story that Jesus has been resurrected, raised from the dead. And so like she's had like a crazy supernatural morning and she's still a little bit skeptical. She says, tell me where you have laid him. So she's of the belief that he's still dead, right? Where have you carried him, right? He wasn't under, under his own strength. And where have you laid him? And I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, so it's possible she did not recognize him because she was facing the wrong way. It's possible she didn't recognize him because, right, she had been weeping so much, whatever the case may be. But she turned to him and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, Rabbi, teacher, right? She recognizes her Lord upon his saying her name. And behold, Jesus met them, right? And it's possible now that there's, like I said, possibly more women here, and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Now, it's possible these are two separate moments, like a separate visitation of Jesus to some other women. All right? Uh, like I said, there's multiple ways, plausible ways, that you could sequence these accounts. And Jesus said to her, that's Mary, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Right, and so Jesus, this is the first appearance that Jesus gives uh, to Mary, right, to anybody. And he, and he tells her like, don't cling to me, I've not yet ascended to my Father, but go and tell my disciples. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers. Now what's interesting is here, he's possibly talking about uh, the disciples, but maybe not. It's possible he's talking about his own half-brothers uh, who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, right? They thought uh, Jesus's family seemed to have thought that he was crazy at one point, uh, it says in the biblical account, which once again, is kind of some of that quote-unquote embarrassing testimony that if it was made up, why would you make that stuff up? That's crazy. Uh, Tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. And so she went, right? Mary Magdalene went. And here's another meanwhile. While they were going, behold, right? And so this, I think we can use the behold here as like a meanwhile. Some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders, so they actually take a moment to gather others uh, and take in counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. In fact, uh, what's interesting is that this narrative is also found in right, Jewish writing centuries later, uh, that it's part of their, their tradition, the, the conclusion that they had made about Jesus. Uh, but what's interesting is what they ended up saying, and it's not only in the gospel account that this is said as a claim by them. Uh, I mean, it's only in the gospel account as far as like this, um, you know, bribing the, the centurions, the guards, if, if they're centurions, which I am actually now suspecting uh, the fact that they said the governor's ears, maybe these weren't temple soldiers. Maybe they were, in fact, Romans. Okay. Uh, but nonetheless, this claim is historically true. The claim that the disciples stole Jesus in the middle of the night. And what I want to suggest is that claim sounds like, oh, well, maybe that's a plausible explanation. And that's actually, uh, you know, that does damage to the testimony of the Gospels. 
Uh, but what's interesting is when two opposing views, the view that Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, who died for our sins and was raised on the third day, and the view that he wasn't those things and didn't do that, uh, when two opposing views uh, hold to the same set of facts, when they corroborate some of their claims with one another, it, it strengthens the argument that that's a historically true fact. And so while they have an explanation as to where Jesus is, notice a few different things. The, the Jews believe that Jesus died. All right, whether, you know, these early writings of non-biblical sources or Josephus or right, even the writings much, much later in Jew Jewish tradition, uh, they believe that Jesus is a, 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 an actual human being that had lived and died. They also believe that the tomb was empty. All right, and this is a really big deal. Two opposing views both claim that the tomb was empty that morning. And so what that means is that that, as a historical fact, is going to uh, nullify other possible theories about this whole did Jesus raise from the dead thing. All right, that it excludes a whole bunch of other theories that come hundreds of years later. Because the early accounts, both, so both sides, both claims agree on this point that Jesus' body was not in the tomb. And even uh, a month and a half later or so, uh, Peter ends up preaching, saying this. Looks, looks like i got to scroll down. I think my head's in the way. Yeah? Here it is. Peter preaches in Jerusalem, and he says this. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works. Right? One of the evidences of who Jesus is, is the miracles that he performed and wonders and signs that God did God did through him in your midst like you should have believed these things it was pretty evident as you yourselves knows no this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God like God wasn't blindsided or surprised when this happened he says you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. All right, and so Peter proclaims the resurrection of Jesus within a month in the city. This is timid, scared Peter who denied Jesus, right? But now he's boldly proclaiming it to the very crowds, the very people that had killed Jesus. And what I want to point out is that Peter declared that Jesus was raised from the dead. And if that was a false claim, if, G if Jesus' body was still in the tomb, they could have gone to the tomb and validated the fact that Jesus had been dead and was still dead. But they couldn't, and they didn't, because even they agreed that the tomb was empty. Let's, let's keep going. Now, back to the ladies, uh, and those who had been with him, uh, so they, they went and announced this news to the, the disciples about the resurrected Jesus. They saw him. They told the disciples as they mourned and wept. And so the disciples, they're still grieving. Even though they know that the tomb is empty, they think Jesus is still dead. Not all have come to believe. It's possible I was wrong about John coming to believe in that moment. Maybe it was a little bit later. Right, And so Mary announces to the disciples, these women announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Right, And so she relays what she'd experienced. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. They still are slow to to believe. They're still skeptical of these claims. And on the evening of that day, so the disciples still don't believe, the first day of the week, so this is Sunday night, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. And so once again, when John wrote about Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea being afraid of the Jews, he himself was in that group. Uh, Jesus came and stood among them 
right? Jesus appears and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. He's like, hey guys, check this out. Same Jesus. You should have believed those ladies, right? And the, the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And so, uh, this I want to point out, right, is this sort of this sort of evidence that the disciples are experiencing, right? They're hearing multiple lines of testimony. They saw the tomb was empty. They have Jesus himself visit them, and then Jesus validates his claims by showing them his wounds. And this is what, in Luke's account, this is one of the things that he wrote about as he wrote his book to Theophilus. He says, inasmuch as many... Many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, right? He was a later gospel author, okay? Uh, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. Right, that there's a distinction between his gospel and the others. He is trying to, as right, this doctor, as this historian, to write this very sequenced ac account as opposed to Matthew and Mark, which had already been written. He says, I want to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Right, that Christianity is not a religion of blind faith. Christianity is one of historical evidence that God wants to prove himself to you, that Jesus was willing to show his wounds to his doubting and skeptical disciples, that Luke writes this entire gospel with the purpose of gathering evidence, interviewing witnesses, so that those who read it can be certain of what they read. Right, that like John writes his gospel, that we would believe and have life in his name, Luke writes his to someone who already believes, but still has doubts. And he wants us to be certain. The Holy Spirit inspires this gospel. Right? The Holy Spirit writes through Luke. God wants you to believe and is willing to give evidence to that end. Jesus is willing to show his wounds to bring about the belief of his disciples. And so Jesus, he said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And so Jesus filling them with the Holy Spirit, he's saying, you can, I'm sending you. You are empowered by God's Spirit. Just as I had been anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and with power, and I went about doing good, healing all of those who were oppressed by the devil, so I am sending you. And you have the Holy Spirit now, and you can proclaim this good news and even declare people's sins forgiven. Because God the Holy Spirit dwells within you, right? John ends up writing later on in one of his letters to the churches. He says, listen, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life, right? That you and I, when we come to repent, believe, and receive this gift that Jesus offers, we can know for certain that we have been forgiven, that we have eternal life. There doesn't need to be any doubt about it. Luke wants us to be certain of this fact, right? The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead is evidence to us that it is finished, that we are forgiven, that we can experience life by believing in Jesus, that we can see the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures from the Old Testament in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus.
One last point that I want to hit all the way up at the top. And this one's not a Bible quote, but it, it summarizes some of these concepts from the Bible. Let's see, right here, William Lane Craig. Now, the uh, religious leaders, the Pharisees, had gone to Pilate right when Jesus was buried and said, we want to stop this testimony from getting out. Now, some people aren't as right uh, malicious in their attempts to stop the truth, right? Some people are uh, you know, gen genuinely skeptical. But this is one of the things that I want I want to help you with, okay? Because maybe you don't like the way that I've sequenced it, or maybe you feel there were contradictions. Now, I'd, I'd ask that you go and investigate further, right? Don't be like those two disciples that hear all this evidence and they're like, I'm going to leave Jerusalem and go for a walk to Emmaus. Like, no, no, no. Seek this out. Figure out if it's true. This is something William Lane Craig uh, has written. He says, the overriding fact is that the Gospels are remarkably harmonious in what they relate. The discrepancies between them are in the secondary details, right? Was there two angels or one angel at the tomb? And I want to point out, like, the gospel authors, they didn't think that was actually that big of a deal. Because they were trying to gather the evidence for the most significant moment in all of human history, the most wonderful news in all of human history as to whether or not Jesus was the Son of God and whether or not he was raised from the dead. Right? They, they weren't as nitpicky about the details of like, could there have been two angels? Like, no, they didn't ask those follow-up questions. Right? They were just writing down the things that they were hearing. All four Gospels agree on the following. All four, okay? And so there's, there's even harmony amongst uh, subsets of the four. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified in Jerusalem by Roman authority during the Passover feast, having been arrested and convicted on charges of blasphemy by the Jewish Sanhedrin, and then slandered before the governor Pilate on charges of treason. He died within several hours. All four gospel accounts include this, right? That he died. Uh, he was buried Friday afternoon by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb, which was sealed with a stone. Certain women followers, right? Depending on which gospel account, might highlight different subsets of that group, including Mary Magdalene, having observed his internment, right? They knew where he was buried, visited his tomb early on Sunday morning, only to find it empty. Thereafter, Jesus appeared alive from the dead to the disciples, including Peter, who then became proclaimers of the message of his resurrection, right? That not only is this documented in the gospel accounts, but it's also the early Christian tradition, right? That these, this message went out very early on. It's part of Christian belief and creed, right? That Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and was raised from the dead on the third day. It is part of very early historical Christian tradition. And it's agreed upon with the biblical claims of the gospel authors. All four gospels attest to these facts. Many more details can be supplied by adding facts which are attested by three out of four. And so, it's okay to be skeptical. It's okay to not believe when you first hear these things, right? God is gracious and merciful towards people like you and I who are unsure as to whether this is true. Whether this is brand new to you or if you've grown up in the church, it is worth investigating whether or not this is true. Right? Whether you're a brand new person that has never heard about Jesus, or you're something, someone like Theophilus who already believes in Jesus but has doubts, it is worth studying this out. That you could grow in the knowledge of truth, in the knowledge of Jesus. And that by knowing the truth, you will be set free as one of his disciples. That by believing in the name of Jesus, you can experience forgiveness. That you can have eternal life. And it's not based on some hope-so faith. It's faith that is built on evidence of the prophets, the scriptures written 
hundreds of years before Jesus was alive on this earth, right? Evidence in the ministry and the life of Jesus and the miracles that he had performed, evidenced by the, the eyewitness accounts, right? And all of this testimony that has been gathered by writers like Luke and evidenced by his very wounds shown to his disciples. And Jesus is gracious. If you seek him, you will find him, and you can experience new life in his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I thank you so much that it's not my words this morning that are of any value, but it is your word, the words of truth and life that have the power to transform us, that the, the gospel, this good news, is your power to bring about our salvation. I thank you, Lord, that through the accounts, the preserved word that has been written down, we have sufficient evidence to believe and be saved. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be stirring up in people's hearts right now or at any point when they're hearing this sermon, hearing these words, that, Lord, that they would come to encounter who you are, that they would realize that they are guilty of their sin and that they need you. They need the Savior that your Father had provided, that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God who came to bear the, the sin of the world that you bore our sin and gift us righteousness. And I pray that as people come to believe that today, they would pray to you, trust in you, believe you, and be saved. I pray, God, that they would be able to, with confidence, move forward, that they would know and have assurance that they are forgiven, that they have eternal life. I pray, God, that they would would know and experience this and know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I pray, God, that there would be no shame, no accusation of the enemy that could take them down, that they would be strengthened in your word, that they would be equipped by fellow believers, that they would gather in your name, that they would be experiencing the gifts that you pour out, and that they would be messengers just like these women just like these disciples, to share this good news to this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Love you guys so much. Be in touch.